Newstalk 98.9 welcomes you to our new Four County Area local podcast series. And our first contributor is Carolyn. And her podcast is Widow in the Up North Woods, living in the Asable River Valley after losing your spouse. There's an old saying that says, you can't see the forest for the trees. Being a widow's like that, you get lost in the details of it and lose perspective on the bigger issues. And the bigger issue is, how are you going to handle the next 30 years? I'm pretty determined to figure out how to make the next 30 years the best years of my life. Hello, I'm Carolyn, and I'm a widow. It does kind of sound like an Alcoholics Anonymous introduction. That one word says it all. Widow. I was once part of something bigger than myself. I was a significant other. I was a partner, and now I'm not. Maybe we should start a Widows Anonymous group and have meetings. But kidding aside, these podcasts are just meant to be a form of encouragement. They're not a number of steps. They won't tell you how to move through the grief. There won't be lists of things that you must do. These podcasts are just my stories. And through these stories, I hope that you can feel a little less alone, a little stronger, know that you're enough, and that your situation is unique. Most of all, remember that you're allowed to do things your way. This episode is about power outages, also known as being unplugged by default. Storms and power outages are a fact of life. Power outages have never bothered me. It means slowing down, being unplugged for a bit, but things can get challenging for a widow in the up north woods. When you live deep in the woods, there are very few homes on your section of the energy grid. And if it's not summer, there are very few people in those homes. So restoring your power is not a high priority. If the outage is widespread, it may be three or four days before it's restored. If you live in the North Woods, there are no large grocery stores within 20 or more miles. You most likely have at least one freezer and keep it well stocked with groceries, as well as deer, rabbit, and maybe a few squirrels. And you can't afford to lose all that food. So if you live up north, you need a generator. We have a nice little gas-powered generator. It's about 10 years old. But it was another thing that was solely my husband's responsibility. It's a big old heavy thing. At our house downstate, we used to keep it in the shed and could simply open the door, start it up, and run an extension cord to the house. Here, the generator lives in the garage and has to be moved outside. It has a pull start, but it does also have an electronic start. The battery lives on the workbench in the garage, and I connect it to a battery tender so it's always charged and just needs to be connected to the generator when you need to get it started. But somehow, the battery tender often gets moved to another piece of equipment. I know where to put the gas. I know how to connect the battery. I know how to push the starter button. I know how to connect the extension cords from the generator to the fridge and the freezers. I've got this. The first power failure after my husband passed away was midwinter, and I learned that power failures are a lot of work for just one person. I got the generator started. The house was freezing with the outside temperature hovering around zero. I didn't really need to worry much about the fridge or the freezer. I just needed to keep the fire going in the wood stove to heat the house. I was prepared. I had a woodshed full of wood. As I mentioned in previous podcasts, my husband worked on the wood year-round, cutting, splitting, and stacking, always 16 inches, well-seasoned, and rotated in the woodshed. But looking back, I realized he was much sicker than he let on. The woodshed was never filled that year. He came home from the hospital just days before he died and was upset that the shed wasn't full, so I ordered four cords of wood. It arrived three days after he died. I stacked it in the shed and made another stack closer to the house and covered them with tarps. I knew he was proud of me. I was proud of me. But once again, things were not as simple as they appeared. It turned out that the wood didn't burn very well. It wasn't well seasoned. It wasn't dry. And it was split in pieces that were too big to burn well in the wood stove. I got a good price, but I didn't get good wood. During each day while the power was out, I was running the log splitter to make pieces smaller so they'd burn in the wood stove. 
I had to keep it going or face frozen pipes since the temperatures at night were below zero. The first night I dozed in and out in the chair. I had to feed the fire every few hours to keep it going. The wood stove heats the back room really well, but it has to be about 80 to have an effect on the rest of the house. That first night, I underestimated the amount of wood I needed in the house. I didn't realize how dark it was this deep in the woods. There's a security light on the side of the garage that comes on automatically, but no power means no light. So it was dark, darker than I've ever experienced in my life. The beam of the flashlight barely made a difference. The wood box near the house was full, so at least I didn't have to go far. But how do you carry a load of wood and a flashlight to make your way back to the house? I remembered we had ice fishing gear in the barn, but I never thought to store a couple of headlamps in the house. So I started an emergency list, and number one was to get the headlamps and camping lantern from the barn loft. I made it through the first night. Up the next morning, bathroom first, then a cup of coffee in the old-fashioned blue speckled percolator my mom had given me for Christmas. I had flushed the toilet the night before, but this time it didn't work. No electricity means no pump. No pump means no water. I know this. We live downstate and we had a well, but we lived on a lake and my husband would just grab a bucket and bring it to the house to flush the toilets. Okay, another thing to add to my emergency list, five gallon buckets of water, a nice hot cup of coffee, then tackle some of the things on the emergency list in case the power doesn't come back on today. I go to fill the pot, duh, no water. Oh, but I'm prepared. I hate disposable water bottles, but I always keep a few gallons of water in the garage frozen solid, no water for a while. It seemed to take forever for them to defrost. So I added store water bottles and water jugs in the basement, not the garage, to my emergency list. That night, the generator ran out of gas and the fire went out. I woke up freezing. I looked out the window into the woods and there were lights. I live on 20 acres in the middle of the forest. There are no lights out there. I found my glasses and looked again. It looked like the trees were draped with twinkle lights. It was the most amazing sight. As cold as it was, I had to go outside for a closer look. The clouds had cleared, no moon, crystal clear skies, and millions of stars. It was as if the Milky Way had fallen all around me, and the stars were clinging to the pines and spruce. When I came back in, it was even colder. If I'd been thinking, I would have gotten the fire started again and then went out to stargaze, but I was so drawn to the incredible sight. I needed to get the fire going again. I've made plenty of fires, a little tinder, kindling, some smaller pieces of wood stacked just the right way, and I have a fire in minutes. Ah, but when you burn most of the wood in the wood bin, you're cold and tired, it's pitch dark and the middle of the night, and you're worried about your pipes freezing, it's not that easy. I added fat wood or other fire starters to my emergency list. We were without power for three and a half days and I survived, so I thought it was prepared for the next power failure. Just before Christmas this year, it started with a windstorm. 18 trees were down on my property. There were travel warnings. There were road closures due to ice and snow and terrible conditions. With so many trees down on my property, I figured it might be a few days before we got the power back on. But hey, I've got this. So I got out the generator, hooked up the battery, which had been on the battery tar charger. I checked all the generator settings. I pushed the button, nothing. I checked the choke the gas valve, the start position, nothing. I saw an indicator that said low oil shutoff. So I found the spot to fill the oil, but how do you know if there's enough oil when there's a little dipstick? Does a low oil indicator work if the thing's not running? So I put some oil in and I tried to start it. I pulled and I pulled and I pulled. I pulled slow, I pulled hard and fast. I pulled until I collapsed. I'm sure you've heard me say before how much I hate pull starts. All right, maybe I hooked the battery up wrong. 
I checked the battery hookup again. I pushed the button. It still wouldn't start. I'd have to call for help. There's no cell signal at the house, so I'd have to go down to the end of my mile-long driveway to have a strong enough signal to just send a text. There were 12 trees down across my driveway. I had to cut and move them just to get to the end of the drive so I could text a neighbor. Luckily, he was able to come right over. Of course, the generator started right up for him. What did he do differently? Nothing. He pushed the button and it grumbled. He pulled the rope a few times, pushed the button again, and it started. So, of course, I assumed that the engine was just cold and maybe seized up a bit. He even said that it should start right up again after it had been running for a while. I got the freezers hooked up. I got the fridge hooked up. By now, I'd been without power for about six hours, so I brought in a huge supply of wood, topped off the wood box, collected four boxes of kindling, and put them in the garage. Super easy, since there were so many branches down. Then I got the wood stove going, and I was grinning as I made a pot of coffee on the wood stove, using the water from my emergency supply in the basement. And I happily flushed the toilet, knowing I had two more five-gallon buckets of water for additional flushes. <laughs> it started getting colder. It started snowing. But I had my fire, my wood supply, the generator, my headlamps, my coffee. I curled up and read a book. Around 8 p.m., I realized I didn't know how long the generator would run on a tank of gas. I checked the dial, but can you really trust the gas gauge on old equipment? I looked in the tank, but I still had no idea how long it would run the generator. I knew I had two full five-gallon cans of gas in the shed, but two huge trees were blocking the shed. There was no way I could get the gas cans. By then it was dark, and the roads were terrible, and the nearest gas station 20 minutes away. But what if they didn't have gas cans for sale? What if they didn't have power? I called my neighbor to see if they might have some full gas cans that I could borrow. I didn't know if I could add gas to the generator while it was running, and I was worried that if I let it stop, I might not get it going again. So on my way to pick up the gas, I stopped and Googled, can you fill a generator while it's running? The results? Yes, but it's not a good idea. I decided that since the gas tank is on top of the generator, even if I spilled some gas, it wouldn't come in contact with the hot engine, so I could safely fill it while it was running, so I wouldn't have to worry about restarting it. I still didn't know how long it would run on a full tank of gas, but since you can't sleep for more than an hour or so at a time without adding wood to the fire to keep the house warm, I could keep the generator full all night. 8 a.m. the next morning, the generator died. So now I know, a full tank of gas lasts about eight hours. I added wood to the fire. I had tea instead of coffee, since the day before I would left my coffee on the wood stove until it smelled really bad and was nothing but black sludge. I added more wood to the fire and set off to move the trees off the shed to get my gas cans. <sighs> I was successful, but the gas cans that I knew were full, they weren't full. The last time my kids were up, it probably went into one of the four-wheelers, and no one mentioned it. I put the last of the borrowed gas in the generator and tried to start it. It wouldn't start. Electronic starts are supposed to solve my problems with pull starts, and I hate pull starts. I needed help again with that dang generator. I felt terrible each time I had to ask for help. I knew one neighbor, that was my first call for help, a couple who are friends that live kind of close, that was my second call for help, and one couple who are new acquaintances, my third call for help. My third rescuer, I expected him to pull the starter rope a few times, it would start and he'd be on his way. But no, he was a troubleshooter. He wanted to make sure I could do it myself next time. Some women would take offense, wanting someone else to just do it for them. I was elated. I hate asking for help. Everyone has their own lives and their own things to take care of. If I want to continue to live here, I have to be able to do more stuff myself. So he had brought a battery jump pack. He checked the settings on the generator. They were correct. I had done something right. He showed me where to put starter fluid. He showed me how to check the oil. He pushed the button on the starter. 
and it started. But he didn't stop there. He asked me questions, and he helped me think things through. How long had the generator been running? When was the battery installed? Was it on a trickle charger? How old is the battery? How long had the battery been sitting on the ground? Then he tested the battery. It was totally dead, and it wasn't even charging, even though it was connected to the running generator. I learned that there are different kinds of trickle chargers, and that it's important that they shut off and cycle back on rather than constantly charging. I learned that sitting the battery on the ground without a piece of wood or something under it can drain the battery. I learned that this type of battery only lasts about four years. Mine was at least six years old, maybe more. I learned that I can use a battery from any of the four wheelers or lawn mowers in an emergency. This guy was great and so knowledgeable. I knew I could ask him anything and we could talk about it without him feeling like he needed to do something for me. I just wanted information and I was worried about my water pipes freezing in the crawl space. First, I learned that they usually have to have temperatures in the teens for three or four days before the pipes will freeze. I also learned that a house with a solid foundation around the crawl space is not as susceptible as homes that have skirting. Pipes that are on outside walls will usually freeze before the ones in the crawl space, and they're even harder to repair. If the house temperature is above 50 degrees, there's little chance of your pipes freezing and that the pipes have to be below freezing for days, not just a few hours. So he did mention a small electric heater that's sometimes put in a crawl space that comes on only when the temperature is below freezing and then runs just for a certain number of hours. I was thinking about everything he said and I wanted more information about a heater for the crawl space so I could quit worrying about it. But no power meant no Wi-Fi. But wait, I've got a generator. I can plug the Wi-Fi router into an extension cord from the generator. It worked, and I googled preventing pipes from freezing, and I was thinking about installing that type of heater in the crawl space. The addition to the house is one large room, about 20 by 20, and it has a basement. All the plumbing is in the crawl space except for the water heater. I hate going in the crawl space, thinking if I die, no one will ever know I'm down there. I've been under there only when absolutely necessary. So I was thinking that the easiest way to put a heater in the crawl space would be to plug it into an outlet in the basement. So if there was a power failure, I could plug the heater into an extension cord. I really hate surprises. I try so hard to think about things I can do to avoid problems, especially problems that are going to be hard for me to take care of on my own, like broken water pipes. So I decided to go into the basement and just look at the wall between the basement and the crawl to see if there were any openings near the top and do some thinking. I stood there with my flashlight looking for just a few minutes and suddenly my feet are wet. I hate surprises. I hate when I look overlook something so obvious. This was the fourth day without power and I'd never plugged in the sump pump. This is the first house that I've ever lived in with a sump pump. The water table is very high in this area. In fact, most homes don't have basements. How did I forget this? There had been several weeks of very wet, rainy weather, then six inches of snow that had melted, then this latest storm which was starting to melt. How on earth am I going to get the sump pump plugged into an extension cord without electrocuting myself? I hung the cord over a shelf unit to keep it out of the water. I hung the other end on a nail near the ceiling. Then I plugged in the sump pump. Then I ran another extension cord down the stairs, wrapping it around the handrail, and I was able to connect it to the generator. <sighs> that pump running was a wonderful sound. I was very lucky. There were only about two inches of water in the basement, but I still felt so stupid. I could have avoided the whole mess. I had thought I was prepared for the power failure this time. Why is life so hard? So I learned things from the first power failure, and even more from the second. And I've added more things to my list of things to have on hand for emergencies. I've also created a to-do list for when the power goes out and a to-do list to prepare everything for the next time it goes out. 
And number three on the list, after getting the generator started and attaching the extension cords, is to plug in the sump pump. And coming up next, up north decisions. Big decisions, like should I stay or should I go? Little decisions. Do I need to plow or shovel? Sometimes I don't want to decide, but living up north in the winter, the ground's frozen and you can't just stick your head in the sand. Listening to a locally up north podcast from a local citizen in our four county community. If you're interested and have a podcast idea, please contact us by sending us a personal message on Facebook, News Talk 989.